Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a bill to ban the sale of farmland in Florida to China signed into law. Plus, a long-promised flood reduction pump system in Mississippi might just be back on track. In Southern Gardening, more with containers, but this week we go tropical. And in our feature, they call it a natural beauty. We're headed to South Mississippi and the Crosby Arboretum. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week. A late breaking story we'll likely hear more about in the coming days. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed several bills this week aimed at limiting China's influence in the state. One of those bills bans China and other countries referred to as, quote, foreign countries of concern from buying land for farming or land that is within 10 miles of critical infrastructure like airports, power plants, and military installations. But today, Florida makes it very clear, we don't want the CCP in the Sunshine State. We want to make, maintain this as the free state of Florida, and that's exactly what these bills are doing. The countries of concern listed on the legislation are China, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, and Syria. In other news, weather's still making headlines, especially this time of year, as we edge further into an already late planting season. Some of that weather, anything but helpful. Farm Week's Jonah Holland is in studio with more detail on that. Jonah? Thanks, Zach. A rare May winter snowstorm in West Virginia dropped eight inches of snow on the Alleghenies. Elsewhere, the spring weather came in nearly every other form, including a deadly beginning to last week in Middle America. David Miller of our news partner Market to Market has the story. Seven people were killed along I-55 south of Springfield when almost 60 cars and 30 commercial vehicles collided after a large dust cloud from nearby farm fields created zero visibility conditions. This is a difficult scene, something that is very hard to train for, um, something that we really haven't experienced locally. Drought conditions remain in the plains. Nationally, however, the current drought monitor shows another week of improvement. There were dusty conditions for those rolling the planters this week in the grain belt. Progress is at the five-year average for corn planting with 26% of the crop in the ground. Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Wisconsin remain well off their five-year pace as the soil gets dry enough to allow field work to finally begin. Soybean planting is 19% complete, eight points ahead of the multi-year average. Flooding is still an issue along the Mississippi River. Major flooding can be found from Dubuque, Iowa, downstream to Burlington. The Quad Cities area around Davenport crested this week. Residents near Lock and Dam 14 were surrounded by the river. The crest here was about a foot below the record, or fifth on the all-time list. Davenport's riverfront landmarks were surrounded by the Mississippi floodwaters, but no permanent flood protection is on this side of the river. A double row of HESCO barriers has been put in place to protect the city. As the surge of snowmelt flowed downstream, less flooding is forecast and will only prompt minor and moderate levels at St. Louis and points lower. Severe weather came in multiple forms in Virginia. This tornado near Virginia Beach damaged dozens of homes, downing trees and causing gas leaks. More than a dozen atmospheric rivers dumped epic snowfall this winter season. This is causing concern near the Sierra Nevadas, but the snowmelt is also recharging many streams and rivers in the area. According to California weather officials, 80% of the Sierra's snowpack has yet to melt. The car accident in Illinois at the beginning of that story drew quite a bit of attention. One Farm Week viewer shared with us that, though it might be hard to believe, some blamed farmers for not irrigating their farmland enough to prevent the dust storm. Couldn't they just turn on those sprinkler things, wrote our rural viewer about a comment from a woman she talked to. She continues, quote, I was caught off guard and kept asking if she was kidding. After all, it's not like a lawn sprinkler. And who is going to pay for all of that? Surely not the state of Illinois. 
Plus, it's not the time of year to use irrigation, even if you have it set up and operational. Our viewer went on to say that when farmers have to start worrying about the highway system, you might as well forget about eating. Clearly, farmers are under a lot of pressure these days. Mike? A lot of pressure indeed. It appears a long-awaited flood mitigation system in Mississippi's South Delta may finally be back on track. You may remember that a mammoth flood there in the winter of 2019 put more than half a million acres underwater, destroying farmland, homes, and natural habitats. It was the subject of our six-part series, Voices from the Flood. The devastation of that flood helped bring the issue to a head since a government project to mitigate the constant flooding was actually begun in 1941. A complicated system of levees, connecting channels, drainage structures, and when they're finally built, pumps. Along the way, there have been stops and starts. In 2008, the EPA vetoed the long-promised pump project, but now $372 million in damages later, plus the damages from the latest flood. The Corps of Engineers and EPA have presented what they're calling a joint recommended preferred approach to flood risk reduction in the backwater area. Reaction to the new plan proposed in partnership between the EPA, the Corps of Engineers, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been positive. A collaborative um, plan that is better than anything we've ever uh, seen proposed before. Um, a solution that will give certainty to small businesses, to residents, to, form, to farmers, uh, to people who want to create jobs in this area of our state. I feel like that these agencies did not forget about us. They did not turn their backs on us when we were totally disappointed in the past. And so I am cautiously optimistic that we're going to get approval, that we can move forward, and the people in the South Delta can finally get the help that they have so long deserved and they've so long needed. Folks, this has been going on for 80 years. Other major stakeholders are also behind the new proposal, especially the Mississippi Levee Board. For more than 150 years, it has played a major role in flood management and more recently in generating momentum for the completion of the pump system. In a new statement, Chief Engineer Peter Nimrod wrote, the Mississippi Levee Board is thrilled with the proposed water management solution for backwater flooding in the Mississippi South Delta, introduced May 4th in Vicksburg. This collaborative effort among all federal agencies, including the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, came up with a recommended preferred approach that includes a 25,000 cubic foot per second pump. This new plan will finally provide the people, wildlife, and environment protection they deserve and have promised, been promised since 1941. Mississippi's Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson, a strong advocate for the completion of the pumps, was a bit more measured in his praise for the new proposal. In his statement, he wrote, quote, I am encouraged by the proposed water management solution presented today to mitigate flooding in the South Delta. The plan announced is a positive step in the right direction. The construction of much needed Yazoo pumps will benefit our farmers and all citizens in the Yazoo backwater area of Mississippi who have been impacted by flooding over the years, devastating local economies and natural resources. Mississippi's Governor Tate Reeves has also expressed enthusiasm for the project and so have community members. So, for the first time in a very long time, it appears that people are optimistic that pumps will actually be built. Final approval is expected by the end of June. On the lighter side, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, we stay with our container theme. Our new host, Dr. Eddie Smith, goes tropical with versatile vines that look good by themselves or in a combination arrangement. Here's Eddie with everything you ever wanted to know about brightening up your landscape. Tropical vines, such as Mandevilla and Black Eyed Susan vine, create impressive flowering displays and look incredible in containers on a deck, porch, or patio. Mandevillas have red, pink, apricot, or white trumpet-shaped blooms displayed against the backdrop of dark green leathery foliage. They can be planted in containers 
that can be brought inside during the winter or planted in the ground and treated as an annual. Black-Eyed Susan vine is another showy tropical tender evergreen vine that is best grown as an annual and replaced each year. Known botanically as Thumbergia alata, they are not related to Rebeccia black-eyed Susan, but have similar flowering traits of a dark center surrounded by colorful petals that are yellow or orange. Lemon appeal sports bright yellow blooms with dark dimpled eyes. Orange appeal is a fearless showstopper, boasting bright orange blooms with a black purple eye. This vine will climb anything willing to support it. New varieties are available with white, rose, red, lilac, and pastel colored flowers. Mandevilla and black-eyed Susan vines can be used as standalone plants in a container or as companion plants in a combination planting. Using any of these vines is sure to brighten up your deck, porch, or patio all summer long. I'm Eddie Smith, and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, a very special story about what many in Mississippi call a natural beauty. It's the Crosby Arboretum in Picayune, a living memorial showcasing ecosystems across the landscape, an art form all by itself. Come with us to pick a unit. It's a trip you won't soon forget. Another example of just how extension matters. The Crosby Arboretum. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership, that these are the keys to democracy, and that people, when given facts they understand will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home, that my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report, a turnaround in the markets this past week, clearly a confusing time. Yes, sir. It seems we've finally seen a bottom in the grains, which is interesting. They've been going down, down, down for the past several weeks, several months, really. Mm -hmm. And now, all of a sudden, they're rallying back again. But we'll be getting into that and more. We'll get into the details, but first, the numbers. Heading upwards, we'll see last week's biggest gains and losses. And then, in our row report, what's causing the numbers to rise? And is it just a blip? And finally, we look at the cattle markets and see what the experts have to say about current prices. So, last week, row crops rising in price. Seems like a rally is underway, so let's show you what we're talking about. Last week's biggest loss, lean hogs down about eight cents. This is after a small rally these past few weeks. Seems like the rally is over, or perhaps it's just a correction. Last week's biggest gain, number-wise, wheat at 25 and a quarter cents. Percentage-wise, soybean oil at two and three quarter cents. This week in our row report, soybean, cotton, wheat, and corn prices all up, 
looks like a rally could be starting, but before we get too far into it, first let's take a look at our current planting report. Corn now 49% planted compared to last week at 26%. Soybeans now 35% planted compared to last week at 19%. Cotton now 22% planted compared to last week at 15%. And rice now 72% planted compared to last week at 63%. According to market analyst Chris Robinson, we might have seen the bottom of grain prices for now because it looks like things will go up from here. The funds are, I think, are in the driver's seat. What does that mean? They're short a record amount of Chicago wheat. Um, I put it in the letter today. I think that it's something like 185,000 contracts. If they have to buy that back, they're going to be the elevator ride up. So we'll see. Uh, so I'd, I'd say we'll have to wait and see. It sort of feels like we're closer to the bottom than we were a week ago. You know, corn uh, broke 80 cents in 11 days. Uh, soybeans broke, I think it was uh, close to 90 cents, something like that. We had this horrendous sell-off in the last 10 days. A lot of it was because of what was going on in outside markets. It feels like that's behind us. The, the crude oil seems like it might have found a bottom. It felt to me like a lot of people were trading corn uh, that couldn't get enough action in the, in the uh, crude oil, right? Because everybody's concerned if, if that goes away. Um, I also think that that last takeaway, when the Chinese took away, the, did the cancellations, we already knew about it once, and then they put it in, in the exports yesterday, and it was like people forgot about it for a week. That certainly felt like uh, we might have been the low for a while, that, that 516, 517 area. And I think most farmers now, that's what you're looking at, is next year's corn crop. Um, you know, and uh, I think the, the big level to watch now is, is can we get back above 550? Well, I think that crush issue and what's going on with the, uh, you know, South America with the small Argentine crop, Argentines trying to get beans from Brazil and so they can do their crush. I think that's something that we're going to continue to watch and see if it in impacts ours. But if you look at what happened with bean oil, I mean, bean oil, we were at a, almost a two-year low. This is 51, 52 level in July. Um, hopefully that, again, is behind us. And that's been very, very sensitive to, to crude oil as well. We had that big break the other day. We broke down, made new 15-month lows in crude oil. Um, so again, is the bottom in? It's kind of, a, if you look across the board, you're probably going to see people try and step in here and buy, they call it a tradable bottom. What does that mean? It just means we've come to an area on the charts where there was a lot of activity. And if that holds, that'll be the base for the next move. Cotton's been stuck in a, a kind of a miserable six cent trading range for five months. It's just been waiting for something to happen. We had a tremendous volatility last year, right? Uh, just all over the place. I think people are gonna continue to watch for new crop cotton, 80 cents. That's a big psychological level, just like 550 corn or $13 beans. That's, I think, are the next battlegrounds. And we'll see, uh, the setup is there. The funds are short cotton. They're, they're really but pretty much, you know, they just got short uh, corn, that's another thing. Uh, if those guys have to cover those shorts, that could help us, uh, you know, propel to a new high. The biggest short you got to worry about is wheat. That's a big position. And, I, you know, I don't know where they're going to go with that if they really have to buy back their wheat. Moving on to livestock, in this case cattle, prices slowly inching upward so far this year with some dips here and there. According to Chris Robinson, we've seen a rally this past year, a pretty long one at that, and it has the potential to continue. Indeed, cattle prices this time last year were around 30 cents lower than now. You know, anybody in the last 14 months that has said, you know, the lows, or the, 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 tops is in, the top is in for cattle has been, um, you know, proven wrong. This has been a textbook rally for the last 14 months of why a marketer would want to use puts rather than selling futures, because if you sold futures, you just left a tremendous amount on the table, no matter where you covered them, you know, if you use that as a hedge. People that use puts over the last year, yeah, you probably lost money on your puts, but you participated in that rally. So two, three years from now, I'm sure somebody's gonna write a book saying, you know, this was the perfect time to, to uh, you should always use puts in a, in a rally market. You know, demand has held up. We still have really good unemployment numbers coming out today. That's been the one big what if. People are gonna stop going to the grocery store and buying beef. If demand holds up, you know, that may be something where, you know, we've had these corrections before. We had a correction about a month ago. But the overall trend has been up for the last 14 months. Um, uh, and if you're a producer, you, you always want to keep the upside open. Um, I'm still friendly livestock. And that's it for a deeper look at the markets. Looks like things are turning around price-wise while planting is finally getting close to finish. These coming weeks will show us if a rally is really here. 
Mike. Thank you, Zach. And now a great feature made possible by producers Brian Utley and Jonah Holland. It's about the Crosby Arboretum in Picayune, an absolutely gorgeous place in Pearl River County worth visiting. It's also about this strong support from this woman, Ruth Cook, a volunteer and donor. Take a look. The Arboretum is, is natural beauty. Um, it, it's an art form. Uh, in its own way. Basically, once you come here and you start experiencing some of the, whether it's the workshops or just the trails and enjoying nature, it, it just seeps in and sticks with you. I'm Ruth Cook. Uh, I am born and bred in Mississippi. I uh, went to Mississippi State University and actually studied forestry. There are many a time that I drive down Interstate 59 on the way to New Orleans, you see the sign and you think, huh, I need to stop there one day. And uh, about 2000, I stopped and I never left. This arboretum is showcasing different natural ecosystems that would, that you would see and, and if, you, if you really search them out across the landscape of, of South Mississippi. The Crosby Arboretum is a living memorial to forward-thinking timber pioneer, L.O. Crosby Jr. by his family. And this was one of his favorite sites, this 64-acre parcel. 20 of that is in savanna grasslands and about 40 acres is in woods. Uh, so it's the woodland exhibit, the savanna exhibit, and the aquatic exhibit that we're standing on this bridge for the slough and going into the Piney Woods Pond is about another four acres or so. The Arboretum's mission meshes extremely well with MSU Extension. Extension and what goes on here is real. I think. Um, people go, oh, well, I can Google that, or I can, I can go and look at a YouTube video. It's real. They can come down here and they can get the ear of, of Pat, or they can get the ear of Eddie. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's real. It's not just watching a video. Volunteers and donors are critical to the Arboretum. I have pictures of Ruth with a set of loppers coming down here and cleaning up after hurricane. And so she'll do everything from the, the basic pruning and helping out that way, helping with events. Mm -hmm. From the little to the large is, is how she, she helps with our exhibits. Miss Ruth has been a big supporter of the Crosby Arboretum since I've known her, which is about 10 years now. And she's volunteered her personal time. And she's also volunteered as uh, serving as president of the, the Crosby Board, Crosby Foundation. And she's been really good at helping find funding for a lot of different programs that are carried on here at the Arboretum. When you work here and you've worked with other volunteers and you've worked with some of the founders that had this dream and had this idea to create this spot, um, it creates memories. I mean, I, I don't just see this gum pond or, or this beaver pond, or I, I see the people that were behind some of the ideas, the people that were behind the funding, the people that were on the end of a shovel helping, you know, create projects. The Arboretum would not be in the place that it is today without having donors like Ruth and without having Ruth. If I see Ruth at the gum pond, I know that she is in the very center of where she feels the heart of the Arboretum is. That is her special place. And the bridge, to be able to see the bridge come to, to, to a reality, I know gave her great personal satisfaction and she is a, a vital part of it and her heart is here. I do see a sense of pride in what we have accomplished here. 
um, the exhibits that we've gotten to add to the to the arboretum, I think, has gotten us attention. Has gotten us more uh, volunteers, more attendees. Um, we are creating and impacting um, people in the future. It is a legacy, and I think it's a it's an honor to the ones that have come before me. Um, I love this place. Um, I love what it stands for, and I, I love the mission um, that that it's it's out there making happen. Great story. You can read more in the latest edition of Extension Matters magazine. MSU Extension manages the Arboretum. Just Google it online. Well, next week, our is our climate changing and is that change shifting the severity of storms? Two questions that many are asking, though many also fear the worst. We'll head to Ag Powerhouse, Iowa, where so-called derecho storms have inflicted billions in damage and which has become a weather lab of sorts, helping scientists understand what's really happening in the atmosphere. Looking for severe weather answers, that's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week, thanks for watching.